Okay, folks, I believe we are live. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bill Black. I am the president and COO of the Calgary Construction Association, CCA. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that the majority of those on this webinar are located on the traditional territories of the peoples of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta. And the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. On behalf of the CCA team, our board, our members and industry partners who are co-hosting today's event, welcome to our 2021 YYC Merrill Candidate Roundtable. And welcome to candidates Jeff Davison, Jeremy Farkas and Jyoti Gondek. We appreciate you taking time to participate with us this morning. For over 75 years, CCA has been a voice for commercial construction in the city of Calgary. We represent 800 or so member companies of all sizes from all facets of the industry. We are a champion of our industry at all levels of government. We also provide services and support to them as business owners. From the residential side, we are joined today by BUILD, the Building Industry and Land Development Association Calgary Region. BUILD works closely with various levels of government and stakeholder groups to ensure vibrant established neighbourhoods and new communities in the Calgary region. Also joining us today are CREW, Commercial Real Estate Women YYC. CREW is the networking organisation of choice for women in commercial real estate, bringing women together to build professional and personal relationships, expand industry knowledge and expertise, and support the development of commercial real estate. We're also very happy to have NAOP with us, the Commercial Real Estate Development Association. NAOP is the leading organization for developers, owners, and related professionals in office industrial and mixed use real estate and advocates for effective legislation on behalf of their members. Collectively, we all represent an industry that employs upwards of 80,000 Calgarians. We are all responsible for designing, building, operating, and maintaining the communities where we live, work, and play, the infrastructure that makes Calgary a great place to call home. Today, we will hear from three candidates for mayor of our city on a series of key topics and questions that matter to us as industry and as Calgarians. No one needs reminding of the pivotal time we're in with a daunting list of challenges facing our city and those who will lead us from City Hall. Whether it's the prolonged economic stress and upheaval, downtown vacancies, inflation and supply chain, concerns as to our environment and climate change, or the looming post-pandemic repercussions for however long these may roll on for, those who lead at City Hall are inheriting unprecedented challenges, but with that comes incredible opportunities as they seek to lead Calgary locally, provincially, nationally, and also champion our city as a mayor, major contender on the global scale. Also joining us today as our moderator is Laurie Williams. Laurie Williams teaches in the Department of Economics, Justice and Policy Studies at Mount Royal University. Her research and teaching interests include Canadian politics, women and politics, law, charter rights, political philosophy, ethics, power, and technology, including social media. It's amazing that she had the time to join us today with that rather long list of, of interests and occupations. She also engages in media commentary on municipal, provincial, and national political life. Thank you for joining us to lead the conversation, Laurie. I am gonna hand the virtual floor to you. Thank you very much, Bill, and, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is a great opportunity for me to see a little bit more about the candidates, and I know all of us are looking forward to getting information to help us in our voting decisions coming up. So just to give you a bit of a sense of, of uh, what we're doing today, um, we've got a series of six, six questions plus an introduction and a conclusion for each of the candidates. You'll have uh, two minutes to respond uh, in each of those segments. And uh, I will perhaps uh, focus a little bit more on some of the questions. If, uh, if you haven't fully answered or, or directly answered the question, I may ask for a follow-up or give uh, other candidates an opportunity to respond if something uh, has been said um, that, that uh, they need to respond to with respect to their own records. 
So again, each of you will have um, two minutes each in each of these segments. We'll begin with an introduction. I'll be moving in alphabetical order, but I'll stagger the um, the beginning or the first speaker in each of the segments to give everybody a chance to be the first and last speakers on each of these questions. I will uh, remind you at about the 30 second mark and then just let you know when your time is up. Uh, in each of those segments. Um, and as I said, I'll, I may, I may uh, ask for more direct uh, or complete answers to some of the questions as we go along. So uh, the first segment will be in, in alphabetical order with Mr. Davison, Mr. Farkas, and Ms. Gondek introducing themselves to us, telling us a little bit about who they are, um, what they have done on city council, and uh, what they hope to do uh, coming up. Although there will be an opportunity at the end to speak specifically about your plan for the first the first uh, 100 days or so of your time in office. So, um, Mr. Davison. Sure, well, thanks so much. And thanks for uh, putting this together. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, I, I'd like to start by saying like a TV courtroom drama, I'm here to present my case to be your next mayor. And I really feel that past behavior is the best indicator of future behavior. And so today I'll, I'll talk a lot about what I've already done for Calgary and what I plan to do over the next four years as your mayor. And I'll critique my opponents, not because they're bad people, but because they don't have the track record of getting things done and they don't get Calgary. You know, my opponents would want you to believe that this is a two horse race, a choice between the extreme right or the extreme left. But that isn't the way most of us think about Calgary. It's time to choose a mayor who shares your priorities, like attracting investment, creating jobs, keeping taxes low, and working together to build the city where our kids and grandchildren want to stay. My name's Jeff Davison, and I'm asking to be your next mayor. Thanks, Lori. Thank you, Mr. Davison. Now, Mr. Farkas, please. Well, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to be here with you. So I just wanted to open by addressing something that uh, Stephen Carter, Joe T. Gondek's campaign manager, said in the Herald today. He said that the Gondek campaign is more about personality than policy. And that I quote, it's been a central premise of the campaign. If people over Thanksgiving are talking about which candidate can beat Farkas, then we're in a really good spot, uh, end quote. I think that's a big mistake. Uh, I think our city is not in a good spot and the challenges that we're facing are far too important to make this about personality. To have a campaign focused on trying to tear somebody down rather than build Calgary up, I think that that's a big mistake. So I think this election is, it's a once in a generation opportunity for change. And as candidates, we have so much opportunity to speak about the things that are going well in the city. But I think with that, we need to talk about vision, where we wanna be. And to use this election as an opportunity to tear anybody else down or to go as far as make it a central, central premise of a campaign, I think that's a mistake. So rather than make this about uh, personality than policy, I wanna tell you why policy matters. The wrong policies have been killing business in the city. First, property taxes. The other candidates, uh, I believe, do not have a record on controlling spending. I'm proposing a four-year property tax freeze. I think that this is absolutely vital to getting our businesses and homeowners back on their feet. And my plan is realistic. It's achievable, and it's been vetted by experts such as the economist Jack Mintz. Secondly, compensation at the city. Over the past 10 years, the pension and benefit liability has increased 60%. Thousands of employees now receive double pensions, hundreds receive triple pensions. And while the other candidates may have campaigned to fix, say, the City Council Golden Pension, they both signed up for it the moment that they were elected. I alone kept my promise and I'm committed to leading by example. Third, defunding the police. I strongly support addressing crime and security. I'm an, and I'm the only councillor here who actually voted against defunding the police. I think that we need to provide preventative and adequate social supports. But to say that, say, every cop is a racist, I think that that's a big mistake. Lastly, campaign funding. Uh, councillor Davison is under investigation for allegedly improperly laundering uh, corporate donations from a third party advertiser. And the unions have put in an astounding $1.7 million in a super PAC in an attempt to basically take over city council and try to buy the mayor seat. So I'm supported by everyday Calgarians. I'm not beholden to special interests. And unlike the other candidates, I answer to the voters, everyday Calgarians. Lastly, the record. I have a record of following through on my promises. And that's why I'm asking for your vote on October 18th to bring about real change. Thank you, Mr. Farkas. Um, Councillor Gondek. Thank you very much, Lori. My name is Jyoti Gondek and I'm running to be your next mayor of Calgary. We live in an incredible city and we're faced with a time that we have not seen before in the young history of our city. We still have the opportunity though to be able to attract investment, 
to welcome and retain talent and to reestablish our socioeconomic advantage. We need to be incredibly intentional to do that. And our recovery needs to be rooted in resilience on three fronts, economic, social, and environmental. To start, we have to be intentional in positioning Calgary as a center of excellence in the transitioning solutions-based economy, one where we invite people to combine innovation and technology to come up with more sustainable, greener, and cleaner solutions that we can apply across all business sectors. Next, we have to recognize that all work is essential and that fair access to the labor force is a fundamental right. We have to support people who are in positions of vulnerability as well as those who have been marginalized. And third, we need to have the courage to address the climate crisis by investing in a future that reduces emissions and uses innovation to look at how we live and work more sustainably. Let's demonstrate that a city which prioritizes its people, its economy, and its ecology can set a path that lifts us all up. In my professional and elected service in Calgary, I've begun the work of moving our city towards a prosperous future. The next four years at City Hall will, will require a mayor who can stabilize the economy, who can prioritize the well being of our citizens, and also create a sense of certainty and predictability for investors. I have the experience, the character, and the will to be that leader, one who moves us towards opportunity and prosperity. I'm very grateful for your support, and I look forward to four more years of service to Calgarians. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gondek, and to all of the councillors. Um, this is a very good sign. All of you were well under the time limit for that introductory uh, bit, and we're looking forward to hearing the other things that you have to say. Uh, so the first thing that, uh, that we're going to be talking about today, and again, these questions uh, relate not just to, to the people that are involved in organizing this debate, but I think Calgarians in general, um, and the first has to deal with what I think a lot of Albertans and Calgarians in particular are, are concerned about, and that's that's the future uh, of our city uh, economically in terms of uh, an industrial leader and so forth. So these unprecedented, unprecedented economic challenges that we're facing require significant vision and leadership to attract businesses and investors, um, innovators to come to the city. So we'd like to know what ideas and talents you would bring to raise Calgary's profile and our appeal uh, beyond our borders. Um, I think we've, we've enjoyed a fairly high profile city over the last 10 years, uh, in part due to mayoral, the mayoral leadership, uh, in part due to the work that's been done by councillors by you. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about what each of you could contribute in that way. So again, beginning with um, Mr. Davison, how can Calgary maximize its potential, both as a, a distribution hub and, and something of an in, inland port? And, and how uh, might you also address things like uh, the city's inventory of, of uh, industrial land? How might those sorts of things build into your plan for the future of Calgary? So beginning with Councillor Davison. Sure, well, I mean, I think to be successful, we're gonna have to get out from this cloud of negativity that lots on city council help create. You know, I think frankly, we need to get excited about Calgary and our future. And the goal is ultimately, I wanna keep our children here. I wanna keep our grandchildren here. I want them to choose Calgary. And frankly, I'm the only candidate with 20 years of oil and gas experience in this race. So I guess by saying that I get where Calgary is coming from and I see where we have to go. Uh, I have significant personal experience in the technology sector and in the film sector. I can tell you that talent is the key to moving us forward. And I have been council's representative on Calgary economic development for four years. I'm the only candidate up here that actually goes out and talks to the tech companies that are coming here to understand what they need. And surprisingly, the conversation is never about taxes. It's never about land value. It's never about lease prices. It's all about talent. You know, their, their conversation is, I'm 500 employees today, and in 24 months, I need to be 3,000 employees. And if you don't have the ability to scale their business up, they're not even interested in talking to you about the jurisdiction you're in. And so I think the, the big thing for us is thinking about, you know, Calgary used to be the place for opportunity. My economic plan, my ability to attract investment as I've done for four years will create the jobs to get us there again. Focused in and around, yes, goods and movement uh, and the logistics sector. We have an incredible amount of infrastructure here in the city we can capitalize on. Energy 2.0 and how does technology play into solving that global problem? Thinking about agriculture, you know, in, in the next five years, food sustainability will be a major problem around the world. Calgary can continue. 30 seconds. 
clinics can, Calgary can continue to you know, provide solutions to yet again, another global challenge. And the list goes on, FinTech, agriculture, uh, aerospace, pharmaceuticals. These are all big, big opportunities that we've set the foundation for growth on in the last four years. And now we're committed to seeing it fulfill over the line. Thank you, Councillor Davison. Of uh, Councillor Farkas, please. Uh, thank you for the question. And I'm running for mayor to bring about real change. So when I think about why I chose to run for council in the first place, it was back in 2015. Every year, there's this contest called the City of Calgary Hackathon. And it's a competition of mostly young people, up and comers, entrepreneurs. The, about 200 or 300 of us basically trapped in a room for a weekend, given a really tough problem to solve. And whoever can come up with the best uh, business idea or app that they've invented uh, is basically given a big cash prize and a photo opportunity with the mayor and the blessings to go on and to save the world. And in 2015, I was fortunate enough to, to join the contest, meet up with about six or seven other people. We came up with a great idea that we thought would have been able to make us some money, give us a job, offer something of value to others. And by the end of the weekend, we actually won first place. So somewhere in the basement of City Hall, there's this photo of me holding this giant sized check, uh, grinning ear to ear, shaking hands with Mayor Nenshi. But unfortunately, we didn't get the City Hall support. And because of lack of uh, support and red tape regulations, we couldn't actually proceed with our idea, despite the fact that it was possible in places like Vancouver, Edmonton, Toronto, and elsewhere. And we have this story we tell ourselves of being open for business, about being entrepreneurial, about having a can-do attitude. We are all of those things. Calgarians especially are all of those things. But our city hall is not. So my focus is on getting city hall out of the way by giving predictability, certainty, continuing with the major projects that we've committed to, getting our taxes and our spending under control, as well as bringing more stability and certainty for approval timelines. So I'm uh, committed to red tape reduction, which can actually legislate approval timelines for mandatory approvals. And what I mean by that is timelines, that if the city can't tell you no by a certain time frame, it has to be a yes. And if they tell you no, it has to be conditional based on A, B, and C. And as long as you can solve for those things, you're off to the races. So it's all about, I think, City Hall creating fertile environment for the private sector, for entrepreneurs, and for the market to succeed. It's not City Hall's job to create businesses or to create jobs, but it's to make sure that you have the support, the stability, and the certainty that you need to be able to succeed. Thank you, Councillor Farkas. I'm sorry about that. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, Councillor Gondek, please. Thanks very much for the question, Lori. I think strengthening our economy really means that we have to strengthen our labor force. And in speaking with young professionals and companies in Calgary, I can tell you that people are looking for meaningful work, uh, work that helps to make a difference. That's why companies like Benevity have been so successful in our city. That's why companies like Avatar Innovations have been able to do some pretty incredible work in setting up a center for energy transition right in our downtown. Uh, they are doing a carbon removal accelerator project, which is just amazing. That's the kind of work that these young professionals are saying makes them feel like they're part of something bigger, something that can actually change our world in a meaningful way. And I think we have to look at the fact that we can also create economic opportunity if we invest in women. We have learned that women-led enterprises are actually outperforming their male counterparts by 63%, and yet they're only receiving about 2% of the available capital. So by exercising gender equality, we could actually bring back our economy, but we'll need to have supports in place as well. We'll need to make sure that we are strong in terms of childcare, so we can encourage that labor force participation and investment in the arts and the creative sector. We have to look at it as a business prop proposition. We have traditionally uh, considered arts to be some sort of charitable cause. It's not, it's actually 24,000 full year jobs in this city. And the contribution was about $2 billion in GDP. Seconds. So when you look at the different types of sectors we have that we need to focus on, it just, it screams diversity. We're already doing it. We need to continue promoting it. And to your specific question about what we do as an inland port, I believe that we have to have a regional economic development strategy. That's something we've been missing for a long time. We have to stop competing with other municipalities and join forces with them to bring back our advantage. Thank you, Councillor Gondek. Um, 
we're actually going to be coming back to some of the points that all of you raised in this in this question to get a bit more detail. But the next question deals with basically building the city. Uh, and all Calgarians are keenly aware of some of the challenges that we're facing. Uh, so uh, we'd like to get a sense of, of uh, how you'd approach key issues in Calgary, things like um, community challenges, amenities, downtown and infrastructure, uh, including, of course, property tax allocation, other sources of revenue, especially given the, uh, the changes that have happened at the provincial level, um, the greater downtown plan, and, and specifically, I think we'd like to have a bit of a sense of how you voted on that, on that particular uh, plan. Um, clean energy policy, um, basically what you see is, as um, reinvesting in Calgary communities and dealing with some of these challenges. So we'll begin this with, uh, with Councillor Farkas, please. So I, I didn't support the downtown plan because I think it was focused on the wrong things. People won't go downtown if they don't feel safe. And now Calgary is the only major North American city without a downtown police station. It was closed at the same time, around the same time as the drug site was opened. And I think this defund and abolish the police rhetoric, I think it's misguided. It puts our communities in danger, but it also impacts our uh, economic competitiveness. So we need to address the safety of the downtown. Next, we need to ensure that it's protected in the event of another flood. So many international investors, they think of downtown Calgary being underwater, and we need to make sure that we're proactive on those measures to be able to protect those investments, as well as things like the Arts Commons, the BMO Centre, the new hockey rink. Next, we need to address uh, affordability. Why would Calgary insist on policies that makes their downtown the most expensive parking prices in North America, if not the world? I think that that's completely at odds. Other things around, say, providing access to amenities. So I was the only councillor who tried to save the Eau Claire YMCA because I think that the downtown actually needs to be a functioning neighbourhood. We need access to recreation. We need access to employment. We need access to education. We need strong support for uh, our post-secondary institutions. We need to make sure that Calgary is a, our downtown is a safe, it's an exciting place to be, that it's an affordable place to be. And I think current decisions by council, I think are just setting us on the wrong road. So things like defunding the police, like say for example, even starting to sell off inner city parks. So the Richmond Green Park, uh, two ball diamonds are being sold for development. And I think we need to be leaning in. We need to keep our green spaces. We need to keep Calgary attractive for say young families. To 30 be seconds. Other issues say around the guidebook. So a council is pushing through a misguided development policy that basically says everybody should live uh, in the high density uh, condos. And I think that we need single family homes if we're gonna be able to attract and compete for talent. But I think this downtown plan with say $10 million in new planning bureaucracy, you know, it's not more government. It's not more of the same kind of thinking to get us out of this problem. We need change and we need something new. Thank you, Councillor Farkas. I, I just wanted to briefly follow up um, your, your characterization of defunding the police. Uh, wasn't it a matter of reallocating funding, something that was actually were supported by the police themselves? In other words, investing in mental health and dealing with some of the problems in more effective ways? Sure, and, and like, unlike Councillor Gondek, I supported our mental health and addiction strategy from day one. I'm strongly in support of those preventative measures that reduce the burden on the police but massive reallocations in a single year, I think impacts the police more than anybody else. It's sort of like scrapping an airplane in mid-flight for parts. It kind of sounds good, but you got to stick the landing first. So my position is funding those programs first, and then when the demand on the police is less, then let's talk about right-sizing their budget. But taking such extreme views that say that the very foundation of policing is racist, this sets off, uh, I think, a lot of moderate centrist people who otherwise would be on board with an agenda for diversity and accountability. I'll, I'll just comment that I didn't hear anybody saying that the foundation of all of the, the refunding uh, or, or reallocation of funding had to do with racism. Uh, but I'll leave it to your, your colleagues, council colleagues, to address some of those other points. So, uh, Councillor Gallenbeck, you're next. I don't know if you want to respond to the, the uh, claim made about um, voting against mental health supports uh, and so forth. That'll leave it to you to respond to that and answer the question. Thank you very much, Laurie. And I'm going to go back to the question that you asked us, which is how do we strengthen our city? How do we how do we go about practicing proper city building? I wholeheartedly supported the downtown strategy for a very specific reason. In 2014, when we started to see oil and gas leaving our city, I remember the commercial real estate sector saying to me when I was running the Westman Center, that there's going to be trouble at City Hall. Budgets are not going to be what they used to be. We will start to lose property tax revenue when those buildings depreciate. And that's exactly what happened over time. 
So the reason I voted in favor of the downtown revitalization strategy is because it was built cooperatively with a number of stakeholders by experts in real estate, by community leaders, by downtown businesses and our administration. They all came back and said, if you invest in yourself, we will see success. And that's why I supported the $45 million investment fund to convert some of those spaces from office to residential. And we have already seen that fund fully subscribed. It sends a signal that we believe in a strong future so other people are willing to invest here as well. And let's talk about safety downtown. We just opened a community safety hub in partnership with the Calgary Police Service. That was a great move. Again, it signals the fact that the Calgary Police Service is moving towards modernization and moving towards partnerships. The things that are sometimes mischaracterized, like a drug site, is actually a safe consumption site. It is a way to help people in positions of vulnerability, people struggling with addictions. All of our social <laughs> sector partners have said to us that we need to have those types of supports in place. And let me just say, honesty is an absolutely critical quality in a mayor. You have to make sure that you are telling the truth. We did not defund the police. We tried to support a budget that the police service brought forward where they said, we have an interest in strong partnerships to the tune of $8 million. And we should have done the right thing and approved the budget they brought forward instead of turning it into a rhetorical debate. Thank you, Councillor Gondek. Councillor Davison, please. Sure, thanks. Um, you know, what I hear is reduce taxes, create more jobs, support local. Calgarians have been very clear with what they want. I think, you know, our biggest challenge is that the, the province's uh, property tax assessment piece is broken. But regardless who speaks to taxes today, they can't commit uh, that they can fix this because we haven't been able to fix this. It's, it's a conversation we need to work towards, but it's got to be a priority we have to fix with, with the province. Um, you know, we need to focus on tax base uh, in, in the absence of fixing this. And so part of our reorganization and, and finding efficiencies internally at City Hall uh, will help with that. That's something Councillor Farkas uh, voted against. Uh, you know, last year he voted for a 15% cut to taxes, then he wanted to restore 6% to taxes. Now it's a freeze. It's just the typical wishy-washy of, you know, what's going on and when you put the math together. You know, it, part of the, the equation we have here is we have to reimagine our downtown. So, you know, I always say to people, why does the downtown matter to you? Whether you're the teacher in Tuscany, whether you're the electrician in Evergreen, downtown matters because it's the economic heartbeat of our city. And it is oh, for over 50 years protected homeowners from massive tax increases. The downtown directly fuels our economy, which means we have a higher quality of life and we have to fight to get that vision back. And this has been the focus of my four years on council. It's why I can hit the ground running day one. I am the only councillor here that has championed the event center. The other two voted against it. I stood up for the BMO expansion, the Arts Commons expansion, the field house. I am moving forward with projects that will impact our city for, for decades to come. And I find it interesting that Councillor Farkas talks about how he wants to support the private sector moving forward and get out of the way of businesses, yet the YMCA closure downtown was a private business that he was trying to force government into taking back control of. So, you know, the, more of the same here, I think, is what we're hearing. On the defund the conversation, you know, first of all, this grand plan to put a new seconds. In downtown is ridiculous. The police have already told us, if you build a police station downtown, it will take officers off the street. We need to create a safer, more inclusive environment downtown, not take away police officers because we want to put a building together. And the only one who defunded the police in this conversation was Councillor Farkas when he voted against the budget. Thank you, Councillor Davison. Uh, the next question actually picks up on something you just, just mentioned, uh, Councillor Davison. Um, just the challenges, again, that Calgary uh, faces with respect to um, new opportunities and in particular, what what collaboration City Hall can have with, with the private sector. Um, so obviously we want um, to see a, a better future for, for Calgary and for all those who have a stake in this to have an opportunity to contribute. So the qu question here, we'll be starting with Councillor Gondek on this one, uh, is how you see the real estate development, design and construct construction industry, people that are represented in sponsoring this, this particular forum, how do you see them helping in the development of strategies uh, in the future? And, and, and how do you see sort of bringing their expertise, um, uh, their industry expertise and their collaboration to support the establishment of Calgary 
uh, as a climate change leader. So business partnerships and specifically how those partnerships can help with issues like climate change. And I know you've addressed some of this, all of you or, or a couple of you in previous um, uh, questions, but if you could address this more directly now, uh, beginning with Councillor Gondek, please. Thanks very much for that question, Lori. And I've had the incredible privilege of working with members of the real estate sector for several years. Um, at the Haskane School of Business, it was um, my responsibility to put together the BCom and MBA program for students that would be graduating with a commercial real estate degree. And that meant that I entered into partnerships with experts in the sector to bring them into the classroom so they could educate our students on what they would actually be doing when they graduated. And it led to an incredible number of placements. Our students were stronger because we engaged with the private sector to educate them. And it's that kind of collaboration that I've been able to bring to uh, council as well. We started a real estate working group last November, which is providing guidance and advice to our real estate and development services folks, as well as our tax assessment department. Now that's not to say that we don't have strong people in administration, but when you share ideas and you understand each other's perspective, it just makes for better options moving forward for our city. If you think about Calgary Planning Commission and you think about our audit committee, both of those have professionals that serve in a volunteer capacity to make our decision-making better and to get the advice that we need from the experts. I can also tell you that we created a community housing affordability collective back in 2016, which included members of the private sector and the public sector to talk about housing solutions. So there are all kinds of ways that we can be better engaging with associations and professionals in the private sector to strengthen our government. And we have seen evidence of how well those things work. Um, the financial task force is yet another great example of people telling us that if we divest ourselves of some of our land assets, we could strengthen our tax base. So we do good work in this area and we need to keep it up. Thank you, Councillor Gondek. And now Councillor Davison, please. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think we, ha we have to engage our construction community to build better uh, and, and really think about how do we formulate key partnerships. Um, I think industry doesn't just want the city to engage uh, in order to tick a box. We need real action that can be followed up and be implemented and measured. And so moving at the speed of business, not at the speed of city hall is, is sort of a foundational pillar to how we can do that. But the key is to have all stakeholders at the table to discuss a lot of the challenges and propose workable solutions because all of these partners are tied together. And so the solution really needs to be as well. And I think many times uh, only one party might be engaged out of the, without the consultation, I guess, of other related stakeholders. So, um, you know, we need to complete uh, industry solution so that they rely on each other. So construction consultants, developers, to discuss the importance uh, and realistic ways to develop the city together, in particular, when it comes to things like climate initiatives. I mean, climate change is a multi-party collaboration and will require industry expertise. It'll require the city's environmental team and citizen input to develop an executionable plan. Um, we will need to kind of balance that between economic considerations, the timing of hitting targets. But what we don't wanna end up with is for the city to develop a bunch of ideas in a silo without the input uh, and consultation of industry. So I think our goal would be to, how do we remove silos and, and build better communication in ways everybody can be successful? Thank you, Councillor Davison. And now Councillor Farkas, please. Thanks, and I think that there's a lot of lip service to being business friendly, but the, the facts on the ground don't bear that out. So for example, say with uh, Dairy Queen on Center Street, the issues that they went through, you know, it should be the job of uh, City Hall to roll out the red carpet, not the red tape. I think that we need to continue to, to build for the future. We need to be strategic about uh, the investments that we're pushing for. As an example, I'm a strong proponent of a uh, train line uh, connecting our downtown to the airport. I think that that would be a game changer for the city. And I think that uh, the construction industry is a, really integral to be able to get that done. I also think that we need to be smarter about how we structure these contracts and uh, say, for example, local public art. So why, for example, would it be international firms favored on things like this? I think it should be local artists to be able to tell their story, local fabricators, local industry. Say, for example, as well, with how the green line has been structured, basically so big that uh, local com companies won't be able to uh, compete for those contracts. 
But most of all, I think that we need certainty. We need stability. Uh, it's been said on this call that I'm opposed to those projects. No, I'm not. I think that we need to follow through on what we've committed to on the Arts Commons, on the BMO Center, on the new rink, uh, the field house, the green line. But we need to be smart about how we do it financially. And my concern was always about the city being over leveraged and perhaps committing to something that we don't know that we can even build and just referring to say the underground portion of the green line. But I think uh, builders, developers in the community, they all want certainty. And I think that the city hall's closed door approach, not listening to Calgarians, it's really impacted the, the predictability. Uh, say for example, in the guidebook, the guidebook was supposed to be able to provide some certainty, but ended up hitting neighbors against neighbors and basically uh, inciting uh, basically tons of opposition from the community because of how city hall has dropped the ball. So I think that there's a lot that we can be doing on the ground level in these area plans and the contracting and the services that we provide that uh, keep Calgary competitive, not just internationally, but also locally for those uh, mom and pop operators who are looking for, frankly, just the, the city hall to, to get out of the way and enable them to, to be able to provide those jobs and economic opportunity for absolutely everybody. Thank you, Councillor Farkas. That actually leads um, some of your comments leading to the next question. Um, it's, it deals with how uh, your ideas that you might have for maximizing stimulus and be benefit, for, benefit for the local economy and some of these projects that, that several of you have addressed already. Things like the Green Line, the BMO Center, the Events Center, um, and the scaling and bundling of the project has, has rendered certainly the Green Line large enough that it's unlikely that local business can, businesses can actually compete. And of course, local businesses have an interest. In, in continuing a positive relationship with the city, whereas those who come from outside of Calgary, particularly internationally, may not have such an interest. Um, and this has proved problematic for other cities, as I understand. Uh, so um, how do you see being able to, to approach that? I mean, uh, uh, removing uh, red tape, as I think you were suggesting, Councillor Farkas, isn't going to address that, that problem by itself. What ideas do you have for trying to deal with these large projects and, and uh, getting sort of local buy-in or connection to the city on an ongoing basis uh, to help with this. So this question will begin, begin with Councillor Davison, please. Well, I think a lot of these large projects are the ones that I've been pushing forward with over the last four years. And I really don't believe somebody can sit here and look everybody in the eye and say, I'm gonna build these things going forward and give the investment certainty and security knowing that they voted no to these things. You know, the, this said individual, Councillor Farkas, has told rooms of individuals the event center will die day one if he is elected. You know, no, that, that, that's absolutely not true. You have gone before Willow Park. I had a friend there. He heard you say it himself. So whether you believe it or not, I don't. I think past behavior is the best indication of future behavior. We have another councillor who's now running for mayor who's talking about reopening conversations around the event center. The, the council has made decisions and our construction industry requires certainty and security to move these things forward. I think we are now at a point where BMO is almost halfway across the uh, exterior construction mark. It's currently on budget. The event center was a cash deal from the city side. All of the cost overruns, 100% of the cost overruns are handled by our partner. We get all of our money back and we are able to develop a district with $3 billion with a private sector investment. The Arts Commons build out is based upon the current funding and future funding from CRL. So it's possible to make our money work for us. And it's not a situation of, this or that, it's this and that. That's how we're going to be able to stand up Calgary's downtown. That's how we're going to recover our economy. So we have to think about the phasing, yes, and making our money work for us, but it's possible to do it. Even Green Line, you know, Councillor Gondick and I actually worked together to come up with the 17 financial recommendations that now must be followed. It's now a wholly owned subsidiary with experts on a board, which provides rigor to keeping the project on track. Now, I don't agree with the one bid that the province has come up with. We fought very hard to ensure that local contractors would be able to bid on the majority of work here. We're going to fight to get that back, and I would revisit those conditions if elected, but it has to do with building partnership with the province, as I have done with the half-billion-dollar film sector and building technology into our downtown core. Um, if I could just follow up a bit, Councillor Davison, you want to sure. fight to get that uh, uh, more control over the, the phases of the project, so, so more, more local investment is possible. And I think this is for all of you, a bit of a better sense of how you think you could actually accomplish that. Can you give us a bit of a sense of that in about 30 seconds or so, please? 
Sure. I mean, just as we saw on the West Lake, forming conglomerates of local uh, local groups to bid larger on, on certain portions of the line would be key, right? We had this all worked out with the province, uh, but then because of the delays, they came back with a one bid uh, agreement. And I think that puts a lot of local workers in jeopardy of actually getting the work they need to keep Calgarians employed. And, and we have to fight to get that back. You know, the, the 22,000 jobs that Greenlight will create we need those jobs here in Calgary, not going out to international consortiums. Uh, I, I think probably most people here would agree with that, but um, perhaps in a future question you, you can give, a, and we've got, we've got other related questions down the road. If you could address specifically what you think you could do to, to change that, I, I'd be curious about that for certain. Councillor, well, if, if Councilor, you don't mind, I can do it real sure, quick. Sure. It, it involves a project partnership with your other partners, right? You need to be able to pick up the phone, not pick a fight on Twitter, if you want your partners to come to the table and act like partners. That's going to be directly involved in a later question as well. So Councillor Farkas, I know you want to respond to some of the things that have been said, but if you could also answer the question about what you uh, what you see as, as being able to manage some of these challenges. Thank you, and I do apologize for uh, interrupting. Uh, to be crystal clear in this town, a deal is a deal. A handshake means something, and I'm committed to following through with what council committed to. You know, I may not have agreed with doing every single thing simultaneously, given the advice of our city CFO was to basically only bite off what we could chew. But given that council has agreed to these things, the contracts are in place, it's the job of the mayor, it's the job of the council to see that through. So I think that, uh, again, I want, to I want to be unequivocal and clear in that I'm committed to following through on these projects. I don't think that we need to result to fear mongering or uh, misrepresenting the, the facts. And, you know, I just speak to credibility. You know, I, I learned pretty quick. I can't be all things to all people. And, you know, I, I may have rubbed some people the wrong way at times, but at least people know where I stand. I've been consist consistent on a lot of these issues. And for me, a promise made is a promise kept. And that is why I followed through on promises, like say, turning down the city council golden pension, not just because it was uh, what I said I would do, but it was a way of leading by example. So what I would ask is if you, anybody has any questions about my platform, what I'm actually running on, you can visit my website, jeromy.ca to be able to see my 10 point plan. And again, my 10 point plan is to be able to proceed with these things as well as to do it financially responsibly. So I think that there's a lot that the city can do within our purview to be able to provide consistency and stability. And I think that that's what uh, the city hall has to do to be able to create, to create that fertile environment for uh, the private sector to be able to proceed, uh, to be able to succeed, but not for the politicians ourselves to, to be the ones uh, picking winners and losers. So again, I would just say, you know, I really respect and admire uh, my council colleagues who are, who are running for mayor, but I believe that uh, only my record actually lines up with the things that I've said. So for example, you can't talk about financial responsibility when every step of the way you voted for these tax increases. You can't talk about transparency if you've been the one pushing for one-off uh, deals. Sorry about that. I thought I had my... Was I out of time? Yeah, sorry, I I meant deals behind closed doors. But my, my apologies. I, I just I do want to follow up again. Um, specifically, uh, what would you do with respect to to actually trying to to address the problem of of these uh, large scale pro projects and uh, and how would you, as as Councillor Davison has suggested, how would you go about um, trying to to make it more manageable and something that could be invested in or participated in more fully by by uh, local actors. Uh, the one example say is on public arts. So I think that we should be using the exemption we have under NAFTA to be able to uh, under the arts uh, prioritizing telling Calgary story that of our indigenous neighbors, helping our local artists tell their story, fabricators and whatnot. I think that uh, the scorched earth policy that uh, the mayor and council have pushed with the provincial government, I think that it's lost us a lot of opportunities to better structure the green line and other infrastructure, but also may uh, lose us the opportunity to be able to build more going forward. So if we elect a mayor who's always gonna pick a fight with the province, no matter what they do, then the province isn't gonna to come to the table with more capital dollars, more infrastructure money. And I think those relationships are gonna be vital to making sure that we can build the green line and everything else, but also start on phase two and more projects down the road, such as LRT to our airport. So I think the relationships are really important. I'm not running any on any party label. I think that our mayor has to be independent, supporting the, the province when they get it right, 
opposing them when they don't when they get it wrong, but otherwise uh, not taking a scorched earth policy approach. Thank you, Councillor Councillor Farkas, uh, Councillor Gondek. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think things need to be rooted in policy. And so we have this benefits driven procurement policy that we thought would resolve this issue of making sure that we are trying to be as local as possible when we're awarding contracts. But it turns out that we didn't necessarily implement it all the way. So we tried it out as a pilot and um, we used small projects to try to make sure that we kept as much business local as possible. But it's even more important on the bigger projects. And to the point that Councillor Davison made earlier, I can remember sitting down with six or seven members of council coming up with those 17 recommendations for the green line that were intended to mitigate risk and maximize opportunity. And the reason we proposed the green line the way we did is to keep as much business for the construction sector in Calgary as possible. And unfortunately, that's been overturned by the provincial government, but it's certainly something that we need to look at. And I believe we have to advocate for our local construction sector and go back and revisit why they made that change. I think it's also important to understand that our capital budgets need to be focused on finding matching dollars. So typically we have created this list of the capital projects that we wish to um, execute on, but it's, it's almost like it's sequential. We'll do this one and then we'll do the next one instead of looking at where the opportunity lies. So I think it's important to unpack how we're prioritizing capital projects by understanding where there's money available from other orders of government or from the private sector. I can give you the example of the rapid housing initiative. We know that money can flow from the federal government to municipalities if we show them that we have a strong nonprofit partner to put up affordable housing. It's a similar thing with transit capital that's available with the federal government looking at greening the economy. There's money there that's available. So let's look at our transit projects that could benefit from their capital flowing to us. I think we also have to look at things like the community services levy, which is paid, which is paid by the land development industry. I can tell you that that's where I found the $22.5 million for the expansion of Vivo, which is a recreation facility in North Central Calgary. So I think if we understand where the money lives in the budget and we expend our capital in a way that it invites matching dollars, we can do all kinds of great things in terms of building community capacity. Thank you, uh, Councillor Gondek. Several of the things that you've talked about, all three of you, um, uh, up until this point, leads nicely into the next question uh, around leadership. And of course, uh, to some degree, this is a bit of a predictable question in that, in that voters, I think, want their elected leaders to work together to solve the pressing problems that we're facing, particularly in Calgary right now. At the same time, we want our leaders to advocate for uh, Calgary's interests um, in the face of, of governments that may not be particularly receptive or may provide opportunities that are a little bit hidden and, and not particularly obvious. So what I want to ask now is not what so much what you would do, but how have you demonstrated an ability to collaborate and reach consensus with colleagues and with other levels of government? What opportunities have you seen and capitalized specifically on? And so this one will beginning, uh, be beginning with uh, Councillor Farkas, please. Thank you. And I think that uh, part of it's been the media narrative. I think the, the facts are that we often do work together, Councillor Gondek and I, Councillor Davison and I on, on various initiatives. It's not as easy as the media portrayal. It might surprise people to know of all of the other city councillors with whom I've sponsored the most motions together, initiatives, that sort of thing. It's actually Councillor Drew Farrell. So, you know, if my record is one that uh, I can reach across the aisle, work together with Drew to be able to get things done, like say increase policing in the downtown, uh, transparency on the arena deal, uh, giving Calgarians a vote on the Olympic bid, many other issues, then I think I've been able to demonstrate that. But more than anything else, I think that voters here, we, ha we have a choice between change or more of the same. And I'm here because I, I don't think that the city can afford uh, 10 more years of Menchie. And I think that the same kind of thinking that got us into this trouble is not going to be able to get us out of it. So there are some who may not uh, like my approach or think I'm too rough around the edges, but I learned very quickly that I need to be direct. Uh, and as well as I, I can't be all things to all people. We need a mayor who will keep their promises. And I think I'm the only one with a voting record of actually standing up for my constituents, voting the way that I said I would. And as far as my record goes, think about what you would have done in my shoes. So think about how big the city hall bureaucracy is. Would you have gone along with the policies that you knew were killing your economy? Would you have voted to defund the police and say that uh, the foundation of policing is racist? If you were asked to say, start selling inner city parks that people enjoy, would you have gone along with it? 
No, I, I don't think that you would have. And I think in many cases, you would have voted the exact same way that I did. But every day at city council, I've stood up for my voters. I've taken the hits. You know, I've, I've been vilified and I've been called things you, you wouldn't believe in these closed door meetings. But I've always stood up because there was a job to be done. So for me, I, I'm proud of my record. I want to fight for Calgarians because I think, frankly, that the city is worth fighting for. And we need a mayor who we can count on, who actually will do the things that they say they'll do. Um, I'm going to have a follow up with each of you on, on this question, uh, specifically you to Councillor Farkas. Um, you know, you've been quite publicly combative, not particularly collaborative with others, um, even making allegations about things that were found to be untrue by the integrity commissioner. Uh, I guess I'm just wondering how that lines up with what you plan to do. After all, on council, you have only one vote. So how are you going to be able to bring other councillors on side with you uh, to, to lead on some of these policies that you proposed? Well, to speak to the integrity commissioner, you know, that, that integrity commissioner was compromised, actually having wined and dined with certain members of council. I went to former Supreme Court Justice uh, Jack Major. He reviewed the events that happened and actually found that I was in the right and that I had spoken the truth. And, you know, a, fo a former Supreme Court judge is not somebody that you can buy a, a legal opinion from. But I think every step of the way I've advocated for my constituents. And, you know, if I'm the only uh, voice of sober second thought or reason, say, for example, last year, during the height of COVID, the first wave, Councillors Gondek, Nenshi, Davison, they were pushing a 7.5% property tax increase. And they actually got that vote through. But I think it was the wrong thing to get done. So where, when and where I can collaborate with other councillors on issues that don't compromise my principles, I've absolutely done that. But I think that I've been consistent. I've been advocating for my constituents, frankly, not just when it's been easy to do so, but frankly, when it's been tough. And that's something that I want to be able to bring to the table is a proven record on the economy, on transparency, all of these things. The other council candidates will tell you what I think that they want you to hear, but look at our record and actually see how we voted when our vote counted. Thank you, uh, Councillor Farkas. Um, Councillor Gondek, um, would you like me to repeat the question? It's been a while since I, I spoke it. So basically we're looking, what evidence have you provided to us that you can collaborate and work with others on council uh, while advocating strongly for, for uh, Calgary's interest? Thank you very much for that question. And I think the fact that I was appointed the chair of planning and urban development committee in my second year on council is a testament to my colleagues belief that I can do the job. Um, I was very thankful that they put their faith and trust in me and I was able to chair that committee for three years. And I have been commended by many of them during incredibly long and contentious public hearings. Uh, that I was able to keep my cool and make sure that the process moved forward. So it means a lot to me to know that my colleagues have trust and faith in my abilities. Um, these are also my colleagues that appointed me to be on Calgary Planning Commission to do um, the very heavy work of land development and planning decisions in my first year. And I also served on Calgary Police Commission that year. That is two of the heaviest portfolios that any councillor would have to carry. And they know that I have the ability to do the work. I also know when it's time to step aside. So in my final year, instead of continuing to serve on police commission, I understood that two of my colleagues wanted to do that role and I stepped away so they could have that opportunity. Leadership means knowing when it's your time and when it's your opportunity to offer that seat to somebody else. I've also led the tax assessment working group. I have led the notice of motion that opened up um, allegations of unethical behavior by one of our colleagues and really took care of the systems that were allowing these types of things to happen. So um, I can tell you that my colleagues believe in my abilities. 30 seconds. They have let me take on roles that they know I could manage. And it has all been in the service of Calgarians. So my track record speaks for itself. Um, I've also never had to resort to using rhetoric in council meetings. I've never stood up in council chambers and said that Black Lives Matter is a terrorist organization. I've in fact had to counter that type of ridiculous behavior. Thank you. And just a brief follow up, Councillor Gondek, uh, it's been alluded to by a couple of your colleagues uh, already about uh, some of the Twitter um, controver or conflicts, I guess I would say that you've had. Uh, so I think Calgarians, Calgarians certainly want to see um, a future mayor uh, advocate strongly for Calgary's interests, but on the other hand, um, perhaps some of that rhetoric might be might be uh, might interfere with future conciliatory or collaborative work with with uh, governments or individuals that you've battled with on Twitter. Can can you please address that? 
Yeah, I appreciate that opportunity. I think when something is so incredibly serious as this pandemic has been, it's important for us as elected officials in Calgary to stand up for the people that we serve. I mean, if we hadn't pushed for better availability of public health measures, I don't think they would have been put in place. I can tell you that last year when the provincial government said to us, we're not interested in a mask mandate, that's your problem. We had to step up and suddenly take on responsibility for public health in the face of a government that didn't want to. I can also tell you that this year when we pushed for more, they actually delivered it because we were advocating for Calgarians. So it's a very fine line that you have to walk between pushing for more and being an advocate and representing your people and just complacently sitting by and letting others sort of walk all over you. It's tough, but I have worked with other provincial governments that have not been this difficult. Thank you, Councillor Gondek. And now, Councillor Davison, would you like me to repeat the question? Uh, there's been quite a bit of conversation since I first posed it. No, that's okay. I think I'm okay. I mean, I think, you know, I stand by what I said. It's time we have somebody who can pick up the phone and get things done instead of picking fights on Twitter or not standing up for the health of our citizens, which, uh, like many have seen, uh, have had surgeries pushed off because uh, of incredibly silly decisions being made by the province. I think at the end of the day, so City Hall needs to work for you. And, and running the city from the extreme left or the extreme right does not work for Calgarians. You know, and, and you can't turn one to 14 votes into 14 to one. There's just no way that actually works. You know, the only plans I hear and have heard throughout this entire election have us either fighting with the province for the next four years or involve saying no to absolutely everything. And so, you know, it's my belief that you can't be needlessly antagonistic with the other orders of government and then expect them to support you when you stick your hand out for investment. I think it's critical that we have people who, who have proven they can work across party lines and get things done for Calgarians. Like partnerships, I have delivered. I've helped attract a half a billion dollar film industry here because we work with the province to get the industry's initiatives uh, and rebates fund back stood up. I have worked with the province to bring hundreds of new technology companies here through the Opportunity Calgary Investment Fund. Both of those things have now resulted in thousands of new jobs being created here. I'm the only councillor who supported the event centre here. I'm the only councillor who supported an Olympic bid. I supported BMO, Green Life, Arts Commons. I am trying to figure out ways we can say and and continue to make our money work for us. I support significant economic initiatives, as I have done for four years, that have all been created by very robust community leaders, business leaders, top of class people that councillors now running for mayor have voted against seconds. because they think they know more than these people do. You know, I want to ensure the projects that we have on the on the books are moving forward and I will work with the province on the downtown strategy, further incentives, property tax assessment reform. I think it's all about how you get your council together and ensure that council's goals going forward and their feedback from citizens is integrated with the overall four year plan for council. So I just wanted to follow up a bit um, because I think your record is not as um, as clear, at least not to me, for in terms of you advocating or fighting for constituents or for the city, perhaps against those who's, who who are uh, making policies that are are inimical to our interests here in in Calgary. So can you give uh, some examples of how you've you've sort of fought for rather than collaborating with? Because we need both. Uh, can you give us a few a couple of examples of that? Well, I mean, I think when you spend a lot of time getting the work done instead of chasing headlines, that's exactly what you're doing. You're getting the work done and you're working with whoever you need to work with in order to move forward uh, plans, whether it be at the local level and, and figuring out how you get roadways achieved in your own ward, fighting for your constituents' concerns on, on local areas, things like you know better school planning, things around traffic management, all those types of things, uh, all the way up to you know standing up against the province for what I think is you know, ridiculous health controls that they've had. You know, I'm one of the individuals who has a child whose surgery was pushed off because the rhetoric of some members of council uh, is allowing this narrative that we should cave to the anti-vaxxer crowd. You know, I'm sorry, but everybody has rights in this whole conversation. This is now about responsibility. And I have advocated for that responsibility of all citizens to get vaccinated and do the right thing so that we can get our lives back and get back to normal. Thank you, Councillor Davison. Uh, the next question also deals with leadership. This is a bit more specific in terms of um, uh, inspiring trust and confidence in, uh, in the governance that's being done at the municipal level. Uh, so I'd like a bit of a sense of what you would uh, do to promote transparency and accountability, specifically around 
the uh, the issue of uh, the number of in camera meetings and and how you might approach preventing things like accounting errors that have been uh, exposed in audit reports. Um, one of the ones that's of interest to the to the group sponsoring this is uh, an audit report that report that exposed um, irregularities in offsite offsite levies. So, in terms of accountability and transparency, what would you do to improve things? Um, starting, please, with uh, Councillor Gondiak. Thanks very much for that question. I think it's incredibly important for members of council to understand the processes as well as the policies and then challenge them where needed um, with the specific question that you asked around um, investment income, uh, not going into the right buckets, if you will, that they didn't land in the right accounts. Um, there was a problem whereby it wasn't clearly spelled out where that interest income should be going. Once it was discovered that it should be managed differently, we took it all the way to our um, audit committee to make sure that they could weigh in on how this could be better. It was a collaborative process. It involved administration sitting down with industry, involving the professionals on that audit committee to come up with a great solution. So sometimes you have to challenge the systems you have in place because they're simply not working. When it comes to our closed session meetings, Quite often we have to go in there to get information that's sensitive. It either has to do with personnel or it has to do with a deal that we're negotiating. I think chairing meetings um, in a manner that doesn't take the discussion outside of what you're in there for is gonna be incredibly important. And I've got that three years of experience chairing planning and urban development and running those meetings in a tight manner. So I would be very interested in making sure that our closed session meetings stick to the task at hand. Um, I have also been one of the loudest advocates of coming out of closed session and disclosing anything that we possibly can immediately, rather than just waiting till sometime in the future. So you bring about reform to have greater transparency if you actually dig into the policies that are holding us back. Dissolving that uh, council-led committee, uh, I can't remember what it is, CCCO, bunch of C's and O. That was the committee that was in charge of councillors approving each other's expenses. That's ridiculous. We challenged it. We dissolved that committee. It is now the finance department that's responsible. So you have to understand the policies and practices, challenge them, and make them better to improve transparency. Thank you, Councillor Gondick. Councillor Davison, please. Yeah, thanks. I, you know, I think with with respect to the levy comment you made, I think the levy review and, and infrastructure timing plan that we've started with audit committee is important to ensure we we finish uh, and ensuring that current levy audits are completed and all the monies are accounted for. But more importantly, it's it's the report back that we have to make sure that we we get right. Um, you know, I think. For me in my time and how I manage meetings, I've, I've been the chair of the city's transportation and transit committee for the past three years. Uh, I chaired the event center assessment committee. You know, I, I try to avoid using the tool of going in camera at all costs, uh, just because I, I don't believe that it's necessary all the time. I think we get carried away in there talking about, you know, various things. You use that tool specifically for very specific uses, such as, um, you know, uh, personnel matters, land transactions, dealings with private sector partners. And those are appropriate uh, forms of how you would go in camera to do that. But I'm committed to reducing that. And I think that's ultimately just in the difference of chairing meetings. I think the challenge of people commenting around uh, there's too many in-camera meetings is it's coming from the individual that doesn't chair any meetings for the city. And so, you know, I, I would just say that just because we've always done things the way we do them isn't a good excuse to not think about are there better ways? And we're committed to always finding better ways, more transparent ways of reporting back to the public. Thank you, uh, Councillor Davison. And now Councillor Farkas, I'm, I, I expect you want to respond to um, that last remark. Uh, I would just say uh, I've been consistent in uh, champion against these closed door meetings. I think there's an incredibly excessive use like say a 2017 report, I believe, showed that uh, Calgary's council spent, I think, what was it, like 25% of time behind closed doors, having something like 728 uh, secret meetings when, say, Toronto, I think, had 18, Hamilton had 13, and uh, Ottawa had one. 
And rather than just being an academic exercise, this is actually hitting a, a real world reputation. So most Calgarians, I think, voted against the Olympics, not because they didn't want the Olympics, but because they, they couldn't abide by council's overspending and secretive handling of the issue. So until we can get our closed door meetings under control, I believe that it's going to set us back on a lot of other strategic opportunities. And council spends more time in these secret meetings than pretty much every other city combined. And I think that's an embarrassment. We actually spend so much time in these closed door meetings that now in that chamber of secrets, every councillor has basically their own uh, recliner chair to be able to stay comfortable. Well, I think that uh, we need to set a tone that uh, taxpayers deserve to know how their money is being spent. And on the issue of the audit, uh, I strongly supported industry's recommendations. I'm uh, vice chair of our audit committee, so I do know how a meeting is run and that some things should be confidential, things like, say, around security arrangements, uh, personally identifiable individuals. But it's very clear that there's a political use to this. And because of that secrecy, City Hall establishment, the administration, including the planning department that uh, Councillor Gondek is chair of the committee for, uh, basically got away with skimming money off the top, millions and millions of dollars that industry had paid into these fees and reallocating that interest income into other priorities without actually showing industry the receipts. So I think that uh, I believe that that's, again, setting us back in terms of our economic development potential, hurting our reputation as a flip fair and transparent place to do business. But, you know, more than just an academic exercise, there's a real world cost to this transparency. And there's, there's a real world benefit to actually bringing in uh, uh, reforms meaningfully that uh, will address this. So take a look at my 10 point plan in terms of my specific concrete reforms that I'm pushing for. Um, I just wanted to follow up, and in, uh, in the same order, I'll go through all of you and ask uh, ask you to address this question. I mean, the, the figures that, that Councillor Fark has referred to are from 2017. You've all uh, been on council since then and presumably have had the opportunity, whether you, you capitalized on that or not, I'd be curious to know. What kind of changes have you seen with respect to transparency and accountability? I know you've spoken, each of you, to some of this. Um, but could you specifically address the changes that have happened in terms of transparency and accountability, if you have that information uh, to share with us, um, beginning first with Councillor Gondek, please. Um, I can, I've given a few examples, I can give a few more. Um, one of the challenges that we had specifically with those closed session meetings is that the language was written in a way that there wasn't a timeline as to when you would disclose what was discussed. So we push to make sure that there's a timeline in there. And we've come out of some of those meetings and immediately disclosed what it is that we talked about. So there's a lot of moves that can be made to increase transparency, um, but you have to understand what it is that's in the way. And asking questions is the most important way to do that. I can remember asking questions around the offsite levies. Um, it's something that is not well understood by many members of council. And once you start asking the questions about why is it that we can't move money between the levy accounts? And why is it that that interest didn't go into the right place? It's because we had a void in that decision-making. So the practices of the past that need to be exposed for their inability to work into the future, that takes a lot of work and digging in. And I'm very happy that I've been able to work with administration to figure out where the problem is and then bring forward solutions. I don't subscribe to this practice of saying that administration skimmed money off the top of an account. Um, if that's a way you're gonna go into a relationship as the mayor of the city with your administration, I struggle to see how we will ever accomplish anything. Um, recliner seats. We go into closed session in a room to discuss some pretty serious things and to come forward with mistruths about how we are in there is ridiculous. I can remember the media was invited to see the new closed session boardroom. There are no recliner seats in there. So let's make sure we're practicing some honesty on this campaign trail. Thank you, Councillor Gondek. Uh, Councillor Davison. Yeah, thanks, Larry. I actually, you know, I'll ask when his time comes up. I, I think Councillor Farkas actually owes administration an apology. Uh, I think that there's accounting errors and then there's nefarious activity, which was not occurring. And so the, the argument of they were skimming off the top uh, has criminal implications. And I believe none of that was happening and he owes them an apology. I think when it comes to thinking about how do we do things differently, we address the conditions differently by which we go in camera. And so being very clear under what legal designation we need to go in camera and why has, has become important. We tell the public why we're going in camera now where we didn't before. 
we are now creating a more clear reporting or report back. So anything that happens in is will become public over a certain time period. And we label those time periods so that the reporting is clear when it when it goes public. Uh, and then thinking about, you know, anytime we need uh, secondary reviews, audit, you know, audit oversight has become incredibly important in good governance. And so I think running those projects, uh, such as the, the levy review through audit was the appropriate step to have taken. Thank you, Councillor Davison. Councillor Farkas? Thank you. And this is just a follow up on transparency. Well, uh, my point was that you were talking about figures pre 2017. The three of you have been on council since 2017. So I was just curious what you've done uh, since 2017 to move things in a different direction. Sure. So I, I'm pleased that, say, Councillor Gondek, Davison, and others have actually uh, supported some of my ideas, say, uh, the time limit, a sunset clause. So previously, uh, having something kept confidential was basically until the end of time. But uh, through some of the suggestions that myself, Councillor DeMong, and others made, there's actually a time limit so that uh, people know that uh, once the matter has been resolved, that it'll actually be uh, brought to the public. I've advocated for things such as a, uh, say, a, a voting record website where you can easily uh, track your city councillor's vote on important issues and not just take our word for it, but actually see how our uh, voting record is aligned. And then I, I do also think just the, the layout of the room, it's, it's, it, I'm not going to belabor this point, but I think it's public knowledge that uh, behind uh, the, uh, where the mayor sits in the council meeting room, uh, there, there is basically a, a closed, or rather an in-camera meeting space where every other council member has their own uh, lazy boy recliner. This is not, I'm not engaging in flamed rhetoric. It is just uh, the, the fact of the matter. And that can be verified with the, the city clerk. And then beyond uh, that, I think, it's my job as a city councillor not to rubber stamp what the, the city administration brings to me. It's to use my own independent thinking. You know what? We're not uh, there to represent the city hall bureaucracy. We're there to advocate for the people who elected us. And I think that we need a mayor and council who are willing to think critically and independently so that uh, all taxpayers are treated uh, fairly, whether they're in the development industry or any other sector. Thank you very much. So we're now at the conclusion portion of, of the program today. Just an opportunity for each of you, uh, of you to tell us a bit more about your, your vision for the future. Um, why the people that are watching today should vote for you. And a bit of a sense, particularly what you do right off the ground. Um, first 100 days, how you and your position as, as mayor, should you be elected, uh, how you begin to, to accomplish those objectives um, in those first 100 days. Beginning uh, this time with Councillor Davison, please. Sure, thanks so much. Are we doing our conclusion as well? At this that's point? right, sorry, yeah. that's, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. I meant to, oh. to suggest that it would be your conclusion and just a sense of what you'd be doing uh, in, the, in the first 100 days. Thank sure, you. Sure, I think, you know, the first 100 days is really about spending the first week understanding each other and, and all the members of council because all of us are gonna need to work together on setting the course for our city over the next term. And the key to that will be really understanding each other's priorities and goals. And so, you know, I look forward to that. I look forward in the first 100 days to shovels in the ground on Green Line and the event center and really setting a plan in motion for the city and province to set the new course of, of direction to accelerate uh, investment and job growth in Calgary. Um, you know, but I, I guess I, I would sum it up by saying past behavior is the most reliable predictor of future behavior. And being a mayor is a vital role that requires experience. And frankly, my last four years have shown what I'm going to do in the next four. We've worked with the experts. We have the plan. It's time to get to work and get things done. And as your mayor, I'm going to help the city grow to over 2 million residents, a city that is thriving, dynamic, and affordable for all. And it's going to be made possible because of where we live and who we've been able to attract to this increasingly vibrant city. It's gonna take leadership like I've shown in the past four years. Yes, the mayor is one vote, but you're gonna to need to be able to build consensus to lead the city and build it quickly with a very green new council. It'll involve getting Calgarians to say yes and re-believing in ourselves. It's time to stop writing off Calgary and assuming our future is already ready. Our future is whatever we want it to be. My kids and yours depend on that. And as a lifelong Calgarian, I can tell you this, the comeback of our lifetime starts now. Thanks very much, Lori. Thank you, Councillor Davison. Um, and now, Councillor Farkas, please. Well, thanks again. Is this our final uh, comment? It is, yeah. Great. Well, I, I'm running for mayor to bring about real change. You know, when my family, they arrived as refugees to, to Canada, to Calgary, they saw, they saw our city as so much more than just 
like a place to find a job. They saw it as a, something you can find hardly anywhere else, the, the promise of a fresh start. And so many doors were closed to my parents, my father, my mother, but they worked so hard to make sure that those doors would be made open to me. Look, I, I grew up in East Calgary and Dover. I didn't have a lot growing up, but what my parents were able to do for me was give me opportunity. And over the past decade under this mayor and administration, I think Calgarians have struggled with lack of opportunity. We've seen the, the economy crumble. We've seen the tax burden increase. We've seen the city hall establishment just become more and more out of touch with the people that they're supposed to be working for. So again, I'm running for mayor to bring about real change. I have a 10 point plan, a blueprint for change that's achievable, it's realistic, and it's been vetted to be able to get it done. And if elected mayor, I wanna focus on three priorities. Firstly, a strong and growing economy based on financial responsibility at City Hall. Secondly, safe and vibrant communities through strong and proud support for our police service, our firefighters and other essential services. And as mentioned, an open and transparent government that better includes Calgarians in the decision-making process. Lastly, I just wanna again comment that this has become a two horse race and I'm humbly asking for your support. I really like and I respect, say, Bradfield, Jeff Davison on a personal level. I think that these are two great people and I've gotten to know them well and appreciate them on the campaign trail. But I think the, the stakes are just too high in this election to risk four more years of the same. And bluntly, I understand why some people may not have me as your first choice, but I think the stakes are way too high. I have a reputation of following through on the things that I'll say I'll do. And as always, I'm just going to always be that kid from Dover who never forgot where I came from. And again, that is why I believe that I have what it takes to be able to help Calgary come back stronger than ever. Change starts now. Thank you, Councillor Farkas. And to conclude, please, uh, Councillor Gondek. Well, let me just say thanks to everyone who's joined us today in this important conversation about the future of our city. My interest in running for mayor is clear. I believe that we, we can regain our socioeconomic advantage and move forward towards a brighter future. And I believe that because Calgarians have been telling me that. You've expressed that same sense of hopefulness and optimism in all of the conversations that I've had with you. Uh, my experience in both the private sector and the public sector is critical in offering you the qualities that you're seeking in your next mayor. I have done things like partnering with a cross-sectoral group of experts to create and move the downtown strategy forward, demonstrating to investors and people wishing to locate here that there is a strong future for this city. I have championed investments in public transit, in neighborhood amenities and protective services that have created safer, more walkable communities for us to live in. In 2019, I disrupted a broken taxation system to remedy a flawed formula that was compromising our, competitives, our competitiveness uh, to attract and retain business. It took my experience and persistent leadership to foster change and push for a more nimble and responsive administration and to create an environment where small business, which is the very engine of our economy, felt that they could be successful. I was also very persistent in protecting Calgarians during the pandemic in the face of a provincial government that abdicated its responsibility in the face of colleagues who bowed to populism. I stayed strong to make sure that we were taking care of our citizens. And I will continue to make sure that I am listening to our diverse citizens and businesses to make sure that their ideas are incorporated into our strategies moving forward to your specific question about the first 100 days, it will be my pleasure to pick up the phone and contact the other winners and talk to them about how we build a strong team, how we deploy an executive committee of council to ensure we are using strengths of as many council members as possible to achieve our common goals. I'd like to thank you all for your support and I look forward to four more years of serving you as your next mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gondek. Uh, I have to speak uh, just on my own uh, behalf. I, I've learned things that I didn't know before. I've got a better sense of, of some of the details on, on some of the policy positions you've taken and the efforts that you've made over the last four years. So I personally found this quite educational. Uh, and I want to thank all those who participated in the discussion today. I hope this has helped you to, to make a decision on, on how you want to vote, at least in the mayor's race. I know there are a lot of decisions facing you. And, uh, and I thank you all for, for attending today. And thank you, Bill, for inviting me. Thank you so much, Laurie, for um, being available and uh, participating and helping this flow, this conversation flow. Thank you to Councillor Davison, Farkas and Gondek for your willingness to participate, both in the effort it takes to be where you are now. That is no small commitment. 
And regardless of how any of us vote, um, people need to step up at, at important times in Calgary's history. And you and many others have done so. And um, whoever we're going to work with after all the dust settles, you can be assured that uh, CCA, Build, Crew, NAOP, and many other industry partners have a massive interest as Calgarians, as well as practitioners and professionals. And we look forward to being a resource and a partner in uh, the best chapter that Calgary has ever experienced. Uh, we are sending out a two question straw poll survey after this. We thought we'd have a little bit of fun and see how folks respond. Why not? You know, everybody else is playing at polling. Why can't we too? Um, but our methodology is very simple. There's two questions and we'll see what the answers say. Um, this was recorded, so we will send out a link that can be shared with others that you feel might benefit from this conversation. Um, it's been um, exciting putting this together and as, as an industry that builds the, the places we live, um, it's, it's excellent to be able to get some insight from each one of you. Thank you to our partners, Build, Crew, and NAOP for helping us put this together and for their continued support. Make sure you vote between now and the 18th. I think the advanced polls are closed, but step up on the 18th. It's important. Calgary needs the vote. Calgary needs our engagement. And if you're going to complain about the result, then participate in the vote. That's always been my rule. If you don't participate, you don't get to complain, um, although I'm sure you will. But thank you on behalf of CCA, our board, our membership and our industry, all our partners, please stay safe and uh, turn up on the 18th. We wish everybody the best and here's to the, to the Calgary that we all are going to be a part of moving ahead. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Thank you.